From Unity of Houston, Texas, this is The Awakened Life with Rev. Howard Caesar. Unity is a non-denominational spiritual community providing a positive, practical, and progressive approach to Christianity. Let's join the service in progress now with Rev. Howard Caesar. I'm going to speak to you today about the power of community. I have been supported, shaped, transformed by spiritual community throughout my life, and I know its power in my own experience, and so I have some things I want to share with you about that. But before that, community is about relationship, and this is a, um, these are some quotes from relationship experts who happen to be um, seven to ten years old. So the question posed to Kristen, who is 10, is this. How do you decide whom to marry? And she says, no person really decides before they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides it all way before. And you get to find out later who you're stuck with. (laughs) Relationship expert Derek, who is eight, he was asked this question. How can a stranger tell if two people are married? He says, well, you might have to guess based on whether they seem to be yelling at the same kids. (laughs) Lori, who was eight, was asked this question. What do you think your mom and dad have in common? She says, both don't want any more kids. (laughs) Um, The question was asked to Martin, who is 10. What do most people do on a date? And he says, on the first date, they just tell each other lies. And that usually gets them interested enough to go on a second date. (laughs) Can I get an amen from anyone that's been on that date? Yes, you've been on that date. Okay. So the next question is, when is it okay to kiss someone? And we get to hear from the female expert and the male expert. Howard, who who is eight, (laughs) says this. When is it okay to kiss someone? He says, the rule goes like this. If you kiss someone, then you should marry them and have kids with them. It's the right thing to do. (laughs) Pam has a different approach. When is it okay to kiss someone? She says, when they're rich. (laughs) Yeah. And the last question, which is asked to Ricky, who is nine. How would you make a marriage work? And Ricky says, well, you tell your wife that she looks pretty, even if she looks like a dump truck. (laughs) Oh, Ricky has a hard life ahead of him, I can tell you right now. But it is about relationship. What I want to talk to you about today is spiritual community and the power it has in our lives. And I've been a part of several different ones in my journey. And what really occurred to me today as I want to talk about this was something I learned in the 12-step community, in the, the addiction and recovery community. There, I was, it was told to me like this. There are two parts of the 12-step community. We have the program and we have the fellowship. The program is the steps. It is the spiritual principles. It is the practice of how we work these steps of recovery. But the fellowship is the support from the people. The relationship, like-minded souls who are coming together, who will support us in mutual support, really. And I thought, you know, it's that way in unity, too. That we have the teaching. The teaching that was uh, laid down by Jesus, the Christ, and all the great masters. It was really kind of formulated by our own founders, um, Myrtle and Charles Fillmore. And then we have the community. But it's the same thing, that we can actually do this spiritual work alone. As a matter of fact, when the Fillmores were beginning to teach, after they had both been, re- received healings through this, through this amazing process that they would sometimes call scientific mental prayer, or we'd talk about the law, working with the law, they would begin to practice this and they would teach it. People would ask them. Neither of them had any desire to start a church. Most of the early people who went to Unity belonged to other churches, But there was a desire that was formed on those people. It was like, we want to study this, and we want to do it together. And it was a powerful thing that is continuing to this day. We have the teaching of unity. And boy, do we have an amazing community here at Unity of Houston. This group that you have gathered and thousands of people who are not here in the room right now are part of a community of like-minded souls who have dedicated themselves to personal growth and healing 
through these teachings. And when we allow ourselves to know and be known in community, it, it's magic, really. It just changes everything. I thought to begin, we would start looking at our five value statements. These are sort of guiding words or guiding documents for us, so we're going to bring those up on the screen. And I thought we could just say them together. Oneness. We live from our oneness with God and each other and experience the interconnectedness of all life. Spiritual principles. We uplift all people in their spiritual growth as we apply the principles taught by Jesus the Christ and embrace the universal truths of other faith traditions. Transformation. We bring into full expression the divine idea we are held to be in the mind of God through the expanding awareness of our spiritual identity and community. We join together to create a sacred environment of acceptance, shared trust, and mutual growth, honoring our diversity through relationships grounded in truth and love. And finally, stewardship. We commit to the practice of giving and receiving, to living prosperity principles, and to being good stewards of the abundance God gives our families, our church, and our world. So many of you may not have been aware that we have these statements to, to hold us together in common purpose. That if, that doesn't, if none of those things resonate with your soul, and if you're new, maybe we're not your community. But if there's a spark there, like, yeah, those things feel right, then maybe we are. And there is something that happens when a group of souls gather in spiritual community, particularly, with a, a purpose. This is who we are. We don't have a lot of creeds in unity. We're not, we're not big on doctrine. Really, our only doctrine is God and love. And we, we have a big space for people to discover how that is. But we have practical teachings. We have applications of spiritual principles. And we have these beautiful things we value. So as I wanted to share with you about some of my own experience with uh, spiritual principles in community, I really wanted to center it on those three statements that come from the community value statement, acceptance, shared trust, and mutual growth. So I'd first like to talk about acceptance. Um, we have been sometimes nicknamed the Love Everybody Church. I told the story a few weeks ago that a friend of mine here in our church um, was supporting a family member who had gone through a rough time, and um, another family member said, well, don't let them take you to that love everybody church. Like, like, that would be a bad thing, to go to a place where you love everybody. And so we've been laughing about it a little bit. Oh, yeah, we're that love everybody church. But, you know, I hope so. It's what Jesus had in mind in John Chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So in unity, we, we don't seek to practice so much the, the religion that grew up about Jesus, after Jesus. We seek to live what he taught and what he lived. And this is it, love. And another part of the Gospels, they had, the Pharisees were always trying to kind of capture him in the legality of the law, and they said, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus answered, the greatest is to love. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, in unity, we believe that everyone is our neighbor. So we are the Love Everybody Church. That's at least, what, that's our goal. We're human. We're working on it. I wanted to share some experience from my spiritual community, and I mentioned I was the 12-step community was very powerful in my life. It continues to be. I also, uh, my first church in the New Thought tradition was absolutely transformative. I actually found um, the 12 Steps and New Thought in the same year when I was 28. But there was an earlier community that wanted to be shared today. So I have a, a photograph here I'd like you to see. This is Avant United Methodist Church in Avant, Oklahoma. I'm the, the little kid on the right there with all that black hair. <laughs> that's me. And that's the whole church. The first time that my dad came to visit my, my wonderful sainted father who passed away in October, when he first, first came to this church about five or six years ago, he looked around and he said, man, you could fit our whole town in here. <laughs> 
I said, like three times you could, because there were only 400 people in Avan, Oklahoma. <laughs> the, the guy in the unfortunate plaid pants, that's my Pentecostal pastor brother, Barry. <laughs> the woman who has her arm around me, that's Ruby Stearns. Hmm. My grandmother died about a year after this photograph was taken. My grandmother was a soulmate of mine. I still miss her. Ruby, I think it's so powerful. She put her arm around me. That's what she did in life, too. She said, I'll be your grandma. And she was until she died at 95. She became my grandmother. So as you can see, there's not a lot of visible diversity in that community. But there is a lot of acceptance. When you grow up in a small town, you may not, everybody may look kind of alike, but because everybody is there together, you kind of have to accept people for who they are. I was taught a lot about acceptance in this church. We had people that were disabled. Um, we had people that were um, cognitively and physically, that they were just part of our community. We had people that were um, not the kindest. I'm trying to think of a nice way to say that. But yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> they were part of our community. We, yeah, absolutely. That's what we did. I have another photograph. This is a, church, a photograph of the church that I took about 20 years ago when I was back home. It was a white Christmas, and I was there visiting my family. And under that snow is a roof that I helped put on. Church needed a new roof. So the men of the church went out and bought the shingles. The ones who knew how to put them on, they taught the rest of us. It was about 14, I think, when we put that roof on the church. That's what we did. There was a sense of shared trust. There was a sense that people depend on each other, not codependence, not independence, but interdependence, where we agree to, to depend on one another so that we can do this greater thing. And that's what... We're about here in this church as well. I want to tell you another thing about how important and formative this trust was in me. The first time I ever performed music anywhere, um, my, well, let me back up a little bit. My, my cousin, my cousin Lori, who is two years older than me, she got a little toy organ when, when I was seven for Christmas, and I coveted it highly. I really wanted, see, the, we didn't, we're not a musical family, but at church we had music, and I always wanted to go play the piano, even when I was little, and they were like, no, Michael, you can't do that. So I think it was a little bit of a forbidden fruit, you know, made me want to do it. I really had this, this deep attraction to music, and I got, I got my own little toy organ when I was eight, and I learned to play some hymns using the numbers for the right hand for the melody, and then the, the chords on the, two fingers, and I played, and I was invited into that church to come and offer a solo which I did when I was eight. Yeah, I know. There's was, there was a lot of mutual acceptance, shared trust. So I seemed to have some interest, so my parents scraped together the money, um, $10 a month to give me piano lessons. I know, it was a lot of money back then, for, at least for my family it was. And I began to study piano, but we didn't have a piano. So the church gave me a key to the church. And so this piano that I had not been allowed to play became, that was the piano that I learned to play piano on, where I practiced every day. And that's the thing I want, to take, I want us to take away, how that applies to our church here at Unity of Houston, this idea of shared trust. Because when we trust one another to be who God called them to be, we give people space to grow and to reveal their gifts. It was a pretty good investment the church had in giving me that key because two years later I became the pianist. <laughs> Started writing music and singing. Went on to become a music major in college. Music directed New Thought Churches. And uh, I've, I've sung a little bit here too. <laughs> but it was, that gift was nurtured by that sense of shared trust. And lastly, I want to talk about mutual growth. It's one of the, the, the phrases I pulled from our value statement on community. I have found that people generally don't come to a unity church because it's what their parents did. <laughs> Some do. We have a few of you out there who grew up here. Most people come to unity because they're committed to their spiritual growth. Does that sound like you? Yeah. They come to unity because they, they're looking for a way to take spiritual principle and apply it in a way that is demonstrable, that, that I begin to get results, that I manifest the truth of my being. That's what we offer here. 
As I mentioned in the, in the meditation, who we are is the wholeness, perfection, the, the well-being of God's own nature, and yet we don't always feel that or know that. It's like there are clouds across the sun. And our growth is always to release that which is no longer true or never was true, but we have held to be true. Michael Beckwith says that all of our growth in, in spirituality is subtractive. You don't need to add another thing to you. You just got to let go of some stuff that was never yours. And that is the process of spiritual growth. And you can do it on your own, I guess. It's never really worked for me. <laughs> I have found that when I do my spiritual work in the context of community, well, you get feedback. Because <laughs> um, we are not perfect people. I don't know if you've noticed that, but there's, some church has a, has a slogan that says, no perfect people allowed. I like that. But this idea, my friend Kathy Hearn says, we are in spiritual community, we are always growing up all over each other. And when we do mutual growth, that means that I have to go back to my acceptance and my trust because it's a whole lot easier to criticize than it is to support. Have you noticed? It's a whole lot easier to stand back and judge and point out where your fellow unity members are not quite doing it right. It's a lot harder to step into that relationship with trust and have the conversations that need to happen and, and lift one another up in prayer and support. But that's what wants to happen. And that's what true spiritual community means in this idea of, of mutual growth. Ram Das says it this way, we are all walking each other home. And home, again, is not a place. It is the, the true essence of our being. It is living in the kingdom of heaven within to be that, that light and love and power and joy and freedom of God, to live that. That's who we are. And to get back home is this process of growth and healing and forgiving. And we do this for each other and with each other. I am a little bit of a nerd, just so you know. The Lord of the Rings movies, really good. And though a lot of great fiction, they're, they're heroes' journeys, right? Um, Cindy Wigglesworth taught on this um, recently at our, at our spiritual evolution class on Sunday afternoons. But the idea that there is a quest that each of us is called to, and there are many obstacles in the way. Well, in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, it is Frodo, the hobbit. He has this ring that his uncle had found, stolen, and it was a magical ring, and it had all these powers, and it was causing a lot of disruption in Middle Earth, and it had to be returned to Mordor. I told you, I'm a nerd. I told you. <laughs> and so Frodo has said he will do it with some help, the fellowship of the ring. And so he undertakes the task, and it is so much harder than he thought it was going to be. He had to go through so much more giant spiders and worse. I mean, it is really <laughs> awful what he has to go through. And near the end of the final movie, he's, uh, he's right inside the borders of Mordor. He has to get to the mountain to put it back in the, the furnace of the Mount Mordor. And, and then he, Mount Doom, I think it's called, actually. And he's just done, exhausted, depleted, spent. He can't do anything else. And he, he turns to his faithful friend, Samwise Ganji, and he says, Sam, I can't. I can't do it. I don't have it in me to take another step. And this movie, every, every time I see this scene, it brings me to tears because then Sam, his faithful friend, turns to him and says, Mr. Frodo, I cannot carry it for you, but I can carry you. And that is what we do in this church. That if you will step into community in a real way and let us know you, let us see you as you do, and you'll do it for other people. By the way, back, I meant to tell you this earlier, that the early church, those who really sought to follow Jesus' teachings, they were known for some things in the way they were in community. They were known, as Jesus said, they will know you by your love for one another. That is what they were known for. Their devotion to one another was amazing. They were egalitarian. Men and women were leading the communities in the first century. 
And there was a sharing of goods. They brought what they had into the common good. And they, well, I'm not asking that we, well, we do that somewhat. I'm not asking you to sell your property and give us the money. We're not doing that. But that is what they did. They were so committed to living in this community this way. But I was thinking about that. We want to do this metaphysically. We want to do this um, symbolically. And what we do this is when one is hurting and another is strong, we share our strength. We shine that light on each other. Have you ever noticed how a child lights up when they're praised? This is what we do in community. We shine the light on each other. And it changes how we feel about ourselves and who we are. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Great wisdom, ancient wisdom. Michael Beckwith also coined the term, it's new thought, but it's ancient wisdom. There's nothing new in our teaching. But this idea that Community, relationship strengthens us. And I, for years I didn't understand that bit about a cord of three strands and then it was revealed to me that's God. That when two come together around a central spiritual idea, not easily broken. There was a woman who moved to Houston in 1919. I think we have an image of her. This is Bertha Miller. She came here with her family from Kansas She moved to the Heights, and she had been studying unity teachings with some friends in Kansas, and she couldn't find anyone else in in Houston that was studying it, so she just went around her neighborhood and started talking about it, and people were interested. So they began meeting in her house. I think we have a picture of that as well. That's where this church really began, there in the Heights. The building still stands. It was just relationship, friends coming together around that central cord Spiritual growth, something began. And what began then is strong. Look around this room today. It's still happening. We're in the midst of a a transition in our community. Reverend Howard Caesar has been leading this church and leading it well for 34 years, just about. Yes, absolutely. And he is not what it's about. And I'm not what it's about. It's about all of us coming together in community around the central theme, which is God. How do we live more God in our lives? How do we experience and express more of God? That's what it's about. And so as we set sail on the second century of unity in Houston, It's going to take all of us in community, in relationship, committed to each other, in acceptance, in shared trust, in mutual growth, that we become this cord that is not easily broken. Back to that original group that started. One other person that was there in that group, her name was Lillian Riemann. Riemann. And the seed she planted... You might notice our own Joey Hurst, who is uh, zooming around this campus on his chair all the time. That's his great grandmother. (laughs) There is a legacy, there's a lineage of spiritual community here. And I know we are a big church, and it's easy to be a spectator, but I'm going to invite you to be a participant. I'm going to invite you into a greater relationship with what is offered here. And for those who are watching on television or online, I'm not exactly sure what that is, but we're looking for ways that we can create greater community that doesn't need to be here. We might have some online classes at some point. We'll find other ways to support people who are not here. Our television ministry does that right now. But we're inviting everyone into, yeah, just to taking your place. Emerson says this, that the fact that I am here shows me that the soul had need of an organ. Shall I not assume the post? And if your post is to be a part of this community, I invite you to step in a little deeper. 
Let people get to know you a little bit. It's the way it works. This community is here to serve you. You know, I was thinking about it too as I was thinking about what I wanted to do in the meditation this morning and how the light that we are all bringing fills this space. But I was also thinking about there was light before we got here from those earlier generations. We stand upon the shoulders of the pioneers, of those who have made sure that this place was open for us today. And there is another light of those who are yet to come. And we were part of this legacy. So the point is that we can join together in common purpose for our own benefit and for the benefit of everyone here and, my, I believe, for the benefit of the world if, if we can really begin to take up these teachings and live them. I can't remember now who was it that said um, what he thought about Christianity. I think it was Gandhi. They asked Gandhi what he thought about Christianity. And he said, I don't know. It's never been tried. <laughs> what if we could begin to really practice the principles of Jesus, to practice these principles that connect us to infinite love, infinite power, infinite source of freedom and joy. That's what we're about. It's who you are. Will you do this with us? God bless you. Thank you for joining us for today's message. We invite you to be with us again next Sunday. Unity is inclusive, welcoming people of all walks of life in dignity and love. We believe that love, strength, and goodness dwells within you. May we all live in unity with God, humanity, and all of God's creation. And remember, as Reverend Caesar says, life is meant to be good. Hi, thanks for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed our message. I'm here because I really personally wanted to be able to share with you uh, a decision that I've made after much prayer, and that is that I announced with our spiritual community, uh, Unity of Houston, that I would be leaving pulpit ministry. Uh, I made this announcement March 5th, so it wasn't long ago, and uh, I will be leaving pulpit ministry here at this church as of September 10th. And so in the coming months between now and September, um, I will be sharing these lessons, Sunday lessons with my successor, who is our senior associate, Reverend Michael Gott, who I know you're gonna love and enjoy. He's a wonderful communicator and I wanted to be able to have you experience him as we make this transition of leadership here at Unity of Houston, which I know will be uh, just as strong and have just as powerful a message these Sundays and hope that you'll wanna continue to uh, tune in and be with us. So I've really enjoyed these uh, years uh, on TV with you. Uh, I'm going on to what God has next for me. I'm not retiring. Um, I have a lot in the tank. So I hope I have your blessings. Uh, you surely have mine. Uh, thank you for tuning in, and I hope to be seeing you as we share the Sundays remaining between now and September 10th. Thank you.